Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome back for part two of Cenozoic Life History. So now we're going to move on to the mammals. Now mammals were present all the way through the Mesozoic, however they had a relatively low diversity and they typically grew no larger than about one meter. So the vast majority of mammals during the Mesozoic would have been relatively small, so think of something about the size of a mouse or a rat maybe, and that's mostly because they were being hunted by larger dinosaurs. and so being smaller allowed them to get into small cracks and crevices where they could hide for their own protection. Now as we move into the Cenozoic we see mammals quickly diversifying and filling gaps which have been left open by the demise of the dinosaurs. So mammal remains are relatively common in Cenozoic age rocks, no shock there because as we've discussed there's something called the pull of the recent and when it comes down to it we find their teeth are most useful for the identification of species and dating and this is because mammal teeth are on the whole quite robust so even if you have something that has quite a fragile skeleton like a mouse for instance the skeleton itself often won't survive because it's so easily damaged however the teeth being much more robust will often persist they'll become incorporated into sediments and as such they'll become incorporated into sedimentary rocks so when it comes down to it mammalian teeth in particular are exceptionally helpful for dating during the Cenozoic. So we know that mammal teeth vary from front to back, but they also differ among various orders and species. So we know that one of the diagnostic features for something to be considered a mammal is the presence of differentiated teeth. So we know that mammals have incisors, canines and molars. However, the size of these teeth and the number of these teeth they have will vary between different orders and species. So for instance, something like a cow, obviously because it chews a lot of vegetation, will tend to have greater numbers of uh, molars in terms of something like a, a beaver, for instance, where we know that the incisors at the front of the mouth are very, very overdeveloped. Now, of a special use for identifying mammals are the chewing teeth, the molars, because they are typically the largest and therefore the hardiest teeth, and so they're more likely to survive and become incorporated into sediments. There's also another class of tooth which can be useful to us. These are the premolars. Uh, human beings have two premolars situated behind each canine, and they're the teeth that kind of, they feel quite big and broad, a bit like molars, but they also have a sharper edge to them because they're designed for slicing. They're not quite designed for chewing and pulping like a true molar, they're designed for cutting up food. Now, the molars alone, of which human beings have three behind each set of premolars, are often enough to identify an individual species. So, as I said, they're extremely helpful when trying to identify species and date rocks from the Cenozoic. So we know that mammals are warm-blooded vertebrates that possess a range of distinct features, and some of these features include things like hair, mammary glands, differentiated teeth, and a free-boned inner ear. And so all warm-blooded vertebrates that share these traits will be classified in the group Mammalia. Now, the group Mammalia has three subclasses, the monotremes, the marsupials, and the placental mammals. So the monotremes are referred to as the egg-laying mammals, and that includes animals like the platypus and the spiny anteater. The marsupials are often referred to as the pouched mammals, and that includes organisms like kangaroos, possums, and wombats. And then finally, we have the placental mammals, and that includes mammals such as the humans. So marsupials and placental mammals have true mammary glands which produce milk to feed the young. Interestingly though, the monotremes have developed a different method to get milk to the young. So in the case of the monotremes, the mother will secrete a milk-like substance onto her hair, which will then be licked off by the offspring. So to be clear, monotremes do have mammary glands, and as such they will be considered mammals. However, there are differences, and this would suggest a somewhat separate evolutionary history, and this suggests that there's a relatively early split of the monotremes from the main mammalian lineage. So they branched off pretty early and started doing their own thing from an evolutionary point of view. Uh, the rest of the lineage carried on, and later on it split off to give us the marsupials and the placenta mammals. 
So we can see that the marsupials follow the same initial stages of embryonic development as placental mammals, and so this obviously suggests a strong link between the two groups. So in the case of both groups, the fertilized egg develops into a fetus, and that fetus is contained within an amniotic sac with a yolk sac for food. However, this is where the similarities end. In the case of the marsupials, once the yolk sac is exhausted, the young near embryonic marsupial will then move to and develop in the mother's pouch. Now, marsupials are common in isolated areas, so somewhere like Australia. They were also common in areas including South America for much of the Cenozoic. However, that was until a land connection was made between North and South America, and this allowed North American mammals, which were mostly placental mammals, to begin to migrate south, where they began to outcompete the South American marsupials. So the only large marsupial that thrived after this great exchange, as it sometimes referred to, were the possums, with which we're all relatively familiar. So from this point on, we're going to focus on the placental mammals. Now, the reason for this is that the placental mammals make up over 90% of all mammals, both living and prehistoric. So they're by far and away the most successful group. This means they are also going to be the most numerous group of mammals in the Cenozoic, and as such, they're going to show the most evolutionary diversification. And so it's not really surprising that we're going to want to really focus in on them and see what was happening. Now, placental mammals differ from the marsupials uh, in the method of um, embryonic development. So there are similarities in the initial stages. So as we've discussed, both groups, the marsupials and the mammals, produce amniote eggs. When within that amniote egg, there is a yolk sac that supplies food to the embryo initially. Now, in the case of the marsupials, once the, once the uh, yolk is exhausted, the juvenile marsupial will then migrate to a pouch in which it will develop. In the case of the placental mammals, what will happen is the amnion, which is the wall of the amniote egg, will fuse to the wall of the uterus, and this will allow an exchange of nutrients and oxygen between the mother and the amniote egg. On top of this, we're also going to see the development of an umbilical cord, which will connect the embryo to the mother. Now, the umbilical cord is going to form from a connecting stalk, which is part of the amniote egg, and the connecting stalk is designed, at least initially, to hold the embryo in place inside the amniote egg. So what we can see is that on the whole, the placental mammal method of reproduction is more efficient than the methods used by the monotremes or the marsupials. And so this helps to explain the dominance of the placental mammals over the other two subgroups in the class Mammalia. So at present, there are approximately 18 living orders of placental mammals. Now, at the start of the Paleocene, so that's the start of the Cenozoic, we had several orders of placental mammals that were present. However, some of those were holdovers from the Mesozoic and some were relatively short-lived groups. Now, these placental mammals, which made their first appearance in the Mesozoic and continued over into the Cenozoic, are termed the archaic mammals. And they include groups like the marsupials, the insectivores, the monotremes, and the uh, multitubiculata. Now, they were then joined in the Paleocene by several new orders of placental mammals, including the bats, the rodents, the rabbits, the primates, and the carnivores. So these early Paleocene groups of placental mammals weren't clearly differentiated from their ancestors, and the difference between herbivores and carnivores weren't particularly strong. And of course this makes sense because in the early Cenozoic we were in the uh, early stages of mammalian divergence, and so there's going to be quite a few similarities between individual groups. Now, in the early Paleocene, most mammals would have been small. However, by the late Paleocene, we begin to see the evolution of larger body designs. We don't see the appearance of the giant mammals until the Eocene. And of course, this makes sense for two reasons. Number one, it's obviously going to take time for evolution to produce very large body designs. And number two, in the early Cenozoic, uh, there's also going to be competition from uh, larger bird species. And of course, this is going to mean that it takes a little bit longer for larger mammalian species to begin to evolve and outcompete those larger bird species. 
Now, many mammalian orders that appeared in the late Mesozoic to early Paleocene went and died out. So they were designed for the time, but as evolution begins to move forward, they very quickly find themselves becoming outcompeted by more advanced mammalian groups. In contrast, only one order that made its appearance in the Eocene became extinct. So by the Eocene, most of the present day mammalian orders were represented. Now, it should be noted, though, that of the present-day mammalian orders, groups like the horses, the camels, the elephants, the whales, and the rhinos bore little resemblance to modern-day creatures, so there's still quite a lot of evolution yet to be done. So the warm, humid North American climate of the Paleocene and Eocene cooled during the Oligocene. And of course, this cooling is going to bring about extinction. So it leads to the extinction of several groups of placental mammals, including the giant rhinoceros-like titanotheres. Now, the Oligocene marks a time of considerable biotic change for the mammals, but it did allow the present day orders to establish themselves and flourish. Now, by the Miocene and Pliocene, the majority of mammals would be recognisable to us. However, on closer inspection, we would notice differences. So, for instance, we would see things like horses that had three toes, cats that had very oversized canines, deer-like animals that had forked horns on their noses, and things like tall, slender camels. So, although we could recognise what we were looking at, we would see there were still significant differences. So now let's move on to focus on individual groups of mammals during the Cenozoic. Now, if you remember, during the Carbonifera, so that's the Paleozoic, the Therapsids, which were a group of mammalian-like reptiles, evolved from a group of thin-back reptiles called the Plicosaurs. Now, one of the Therapsid subclades, a group called the Cynodonts, would eventually evolve to give rise to the mammals. Now, the point at which the cynodonts evolved into true mammals is a little bit fuzzy. That's a combination of the fact that we have several transitional species, and so it makes it a bit difficult to work out where the dividing line will fall. However, we definitely know we had mammals by the late Triassic. So throughout the Mesozoic, mammals didn't diversify much, and that's mostly a result of the fact that they were rather limited in the environments in which they could operate, because we have to remember most of the environmental niches in the Mesozoic were dominated by reptiles, particularly the dinosaurs. However, once the Cenozoic started, things really began to take off for the mammals, because of course, they had all these environmental niches that they could now begin to move into and exploit. So this evolution has resulted in approximately 5,000 species of modern mammals, ranging in size from tiny shrews all the way up to the massive blue whale. Now, one of the things we do tend to forget when talking about mammals is we often forget the smaller mammals, so groups like the rodents, the rabbits, the insectivores, and the bats, of which approximately 70% weigh less than one kilogram. It's just, you know, human nature. We tend to focus on the larger, you know, more spectacular organisms and tend to forget about the smaller, slightly more boring ones. So now let's spend a few slides looking at some of the groups of small mammals. So we're going to look at the insectivores, the rodents, the rabbits, and the bats. Now, these species obviously share a common ancestor, and the split occurred during the late Cretaceous. Now, with the exception of the bats, which appeared in the Eocene, the other three orders began to establish themselves in the early Paleocene, so right at the start of the Cenozoic. In the case of the insectivores, they are actually a group of archaic mammals, so they had actually established themselves all the way back in the Mesozoic. Now, these particular small mammals have adapted themselves to numerous microhabitats, which are typically inaccessible to larger mammalian species, and this is especially true in the case of the bats. As the name suggests, the insectivores, which includes organisms like shrews, moles, and hedgehogs, eat insects. So, fossil evidence shows that they have undergone surprisingly little change since the late Cretaceous, and this has given rise to the suggestion that an insectivore may well sit at the base of the great diversification of placental mammals, so it may be an ancestor species for all placental mammal groups. Now, the order Rodentia, so that's the rodents, constitutes greater than 40% of all mammals, with most typically being quite small. 
Now, after their first appearance in the Paleocene, they rapidly diversified into a range of different habitats, and their success is attributable to their ability to eat a very broad range of foods, and also their very high rate of reproduction. Now, such high rates of reproduction actually permit rather rapid evolution, and this allows them to exploit new environments or consume new foods that they could not consume before. Because as we've, as we've discussed, natural selection will essentially uh, preferentially select organisms that can exploit new food sources, allowing them to move into new habitats. And the high rate of reproduction for the rodents allows them to you know, undertake this evolutionary process more rapidly than other mammalian groups. And of course, we can see this evolution um, in, with, you know, in the ability of certain rats to actually be able to eat rat poison and survive. So this is human-based uh, natural selection taking place. So we put the poison down. Obviously, the rats that can't uh, consume the poison and live get killed off, but there will always be a few rats that will be able to eat the poison and survive. And then, of course, because they survive, they are capable of passing that genetic information on to the next generation who can then, you know, eat the poison and not die. Now, a few outliers of the rodent group, like beavers and capybaras from South America, are large, with the latter reaching up to one meter in length and weighing up to 45 kilograms. The rabbits, which is the order Lagomorpha, superficially resemble rodents, with both groups being gnawing animals. They do, however, have several anatomical differences, uh, one of the main ones being the development of powerful hind limbs which they use for speed. Now, modern rabbits typically weigh less than a few kilograms, but one Pliocene example from Spain weighed 12 kilograms, which is about the, the weight of your average two-year-old child. The oldest example of a bat, which are part of the order Chiroptera, was found in Eocene age rocks from Wyoming. Now, with the exception of the specialized forelimbs for flying, bats actually differ little from insectivores, especially shrews. Now, unlike pterosaurs and birds, which typically use one or two overdeveloped fingers to support the wing, bats actually use all five digits to support the wing membrane. You can actually see that over here. You can see how the bat forelimb is designed to use all five fingers in order to keep the wing membrane taut to allow for flight. Compare that to the bird, where you can see the wing is primarily being supported by simply two digits. The other thing you can quite clearly see, once again, is the similarity between the forelimb design for groups like humans, birds, and bats, which of course show that we all have a common ancestor. So now let's move on to the carnivorous mammals. So the order Carnivora is extremely diverse and it includes organisms like bears, weasels, seals, skunks, dogs, cats, etc. Now, the order contains those mammals which are exclusively meat-eaters, so that would be something like a cat, for instance, which we term carnivores. But it also contains organisms which have a more varied diet, so something like a raccoon, and that is going to include animals which are termed omnivores, so they will consume both meat and plant material. So, both types of carnivorous mammals, so that's the carnivores and the omnivores, have specialized shearing teeth called carnassials, and these are designed for slicing meat, and they're situated before the molars on the lower jaw of carnivores. Now, these teeth are a key diagnostic feature for something to be considered part of the order carnivora. Now, the preferred method for catching food varies widely within this group, with some uh, carnivores being dependent on speed and agility, so a good example would be a cheetah. Some prefer more brute force techniques to get to their prey, so that would be something like a badger. Others prefer to use stealth to stalk their prey, so that would be groups like house cats, while others are ambush predators like cougars. Now, carnivores typically have quite a large brain-to-body size ratio, and it's typically much greater than that of herbivores, and this is a reflection of the need of carnivores to have an improved skill set, so they have to have better spatial reasoning, for instance, when compared to a herbivore, because it's advantageous when hunting, but it's also a reflection of their more energy-rich diet, so meat offers a much richer energy source, and of course this means they can therefore support the high energy requirements of a large brain. 
So when we look at the fossil record for Cenozoic carnivorous mammals, we see that they're nowhere near as common as fossils of other mammalian groups. Now, there are two reasons for this. The first one is that carnivores only constitute approximately 5% of the population of warm-blooded animals. Now, we've already covered this in the past when we were talking about dinosaurs. One of the things we notice is that when animals are warm-blooded, obviously they have a higher metabolism and this means they require more food in order to function and so that means in order to support a population of warm-blooded predators you need to have a very plentiful food source so you need to have lots of prey animals on which those warm-blooded carnivores can feed and so this obviously means warm-blooded carnivores can only constitute a small percentage of the overall population. Now, the other reason that carnivorous mammal fossils are relatively rare is that, on the whole, they're quite solitary organisms, and this reduces the chances that they will successfully fossilize. However, we do have enough material from the Cenozoic to allow us to piece together the evolutionary history of uh, the carnivorous mammals with a reasonable degree of confidence. So to be clear, there are no mammals in the order Carnivora until the Middle Eocene, so approximately 45 million years ago. Now this means in the early Cenozoic, carnivorous mammals are represented by two main groups. There's the Carnivora Morpha and the Creodonts. So the Carnivora Morpha make their appearance in the Paleocene and they go through to the Eocene. The creodonts make their appearance in the Paleocene and they go through to the Miocene. To be clear, the Carnivora are going to evolve from the Carnivora Morpha. Now, both groups, the Carnivora Morpha and the creodonts, have carnassial teeth. However, they are not actually closely related. So this is an example of convergent evolution, where we have similar biological structures appearing in animals that have completely different evolutionary lineages. Now, the carnivorous mammals, so that's the carnivora morpha, which make their appearance in the Paleocene and go through to the early Eocene, are represented by two families. There's the Viviravidae and the Myosidae. Now, the Viviravidae make their appearance in the early Paleocene and they go through to the Eocene, at which point they become extinct. Now, the Myosidae also go from the late Paleocene through to the Eocene, but they are the lineage which is then going to give rise to the order Carnivora. And once the order Carnivora are established, they're then going to begin to diverge, and that's eventually going to result in the evolution of the uh, carnivorous mammal groups with which we are familiar today. So once we have the order Carnivora established, we begin to see divergence and the appearance of certain key uh, carnivorous mammal body designs and carnivorous mammal groups. So for instance, we begin to see the appearance of hyena-like dogs in the middle Miocene, although interestingly, hyenas aren't related to dogs. They're more closely related to cats and the group which we call the viverids. That's a group that includes mongooses. However, hyenas and early dogs are an excellent example of convergent evolution. So, of course, that's the, a similar body design uh, occurring for animals which have completely different evolutionary lineages. We see the first cats appearing in the Oligocene, and by the Miocene we have the development of some cat species with extremely large canines. And of course this lineage is going to eventually lead to the evolution of the saber-toothed cats, which are well known from Pleistocene deposits. We also begin to see the appearance or evolutionary trend, should I say, which is going to give rise to the seals, sea lions and walruses. We see their adaptation to the marine environment beginning, so we see the evolution of streamlined bodies with a layer of blubber and the evolution of paddle-like limbs which are good for swimming. Now, in the case of seals and sea lions, we see the evolution of single cusp teeth, which are designed for catching and consuming fish, whereas in the case of walruses, we see the teeth becoming flatter, because walruses have teeth designed for essentially crushing and pulping the shells of bivalves and brachiopods. Now, interestingly, when we go back through the evolutionary tree for the seals, the sea lions and the walruses, we actually see that they are most closely related to the group that includes bears. 
So this is a good place to stop part two. So stop the video, get up, have a walk around, go and get a glass of water, take five or 10 minutes to relax, and then please come back for part three.